Hello and welcome to another episode of the Amazon Unfiltered Podcast. Today we have Josh Justice on the show. Josh, I'm super excited to have you on today. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for, for inviting me. Awesome. So I was actually just going through your LinkedIn um, before we hit record and I noticed you spent some time in China and you did a bunch yeah. of other stuff before getting into Amazon. Maybe you can give our listeners like a four or five minute backstory of what you were doing and how you found yourself here. Yeah, so I mean, it started a long time ago. Um, I was just interested in China. Um, you know, the early 2000s, there's a lot of focus on learning more about China, how the relationship between the US and China works. I would do projects about China. I tried learning Chinese in college, but they discontinued our Mandarin language classes. And so I was just really interested. And uh, I just wrote down some goals in life, um, some bucket list goals. I wanted to live abroad, I wanted to at least live in China. And so I ended up moving there in 2010 to teach business at a university. And I would teach sophomores, mostly sophomores and juniors in this American degree program. It was the first of its kind where a Chinese student could get a degree at their Chinese university and an, a foreign university. So it was a first program of its kind. Of course, now there's hundreds of these programs and all the top schools do it, but, but we were the first. So I joined this program. Um, I got to earn my MBA through the American school, um, got to learn a lot about China, um, got to teach a lot of business courses. It was really fun, really challenging to, you know, relate coursework to, you know, my Chinese students. Uh, so I really loved it there. I went there with the, with the goal of living there three to five years, and I wanted to start my own business. And uh, I got a job offer from this American company that was doing Amazon stuff. And really hit it out of the park, killed the interview, and then the visa got process got stuck because they had just hired a foreigner, and so like they couldn't get another visa approved or something like that. So we stayed friends, and I would shoot the guy a message once in a while just about business stuff in China because I was really motivated. And uh, he had done like the Amazon selling machine. It's now called like Amazing.com. Um, its roots are pretty old and, and they had done this class, the first of its kind, the first type of Amazon class. So he like had me go through the class and, and we partnered together on some products. Um, and basically, I, I just started my own brand, um, a microfiber mitt brand, which I have. I keep in my office next to me. I have the first product my mom bought for me. And so I just I still have it. So, the, you know, with that, I, I learned how to do everything. Um, I did ads, copywriting. I, I had a really good camera, so I took my own pictures. I did all the packaging myself at my apartment in Shenzhen in China. Um, went to the packaging district and, you know, lost five pounds in a day sweating it out. Um, so really hands-on, did everything, learned everything. It would pay for my rent in China, which, you know, was like 300 bucks a month or 400 bucks a month. So... It was doing pretty well. Um, I had a second brand I had started and I had like 20 products that I wanted to launch. And um, and then my wife got pregnant. <laughs> and so we're overseas. And so I had 10 grand set aside to like keep expanding this business. And I tried keeping it going. Um, but long story short, I ended up dissolving it. But what it did, it opened up a ton of doors. I started, you know, advising some Chinese companies in Shenzhen, um, a Dutch company, and really it just opened up door after door and like a decade later, uh, and I had a job while I was doing that in China. Uh, I wasn't just doing that full time, but uh, it just opened up door after door. Uh, I've been super fortunate. Uh, even when I got my first really great agency job, it was like this amazing miracle, the way that it happened. Um, and then just worked really hard, tried to learn from other people, always picking people's brain, uh, and just been fortunate that I've been given some good chances. So it really just started with wanting to work for myself, which there's a lot of people like that in the industry where they start with their own brand. And, um, and me, I just, when you have a kid and a wife abroad and you need to have an emergency fund, uh, I just, you know, I had to dwindle down that 10 grand to like three grand. And so I was like, you know what, this is not like making enough money to make it worth it anymore. You know, when you're back in the U S making 300 bucks a month off a product is, not really worth your time, you know. So, um, but it's great. It's it's uh, I I am where I am today from from uh, that motivation back in the day. That's that's awesome. I mean, today you're managing, you know, Amazon for super big companies. 
Um, this is actually going to lead into my next question. You've done Amazon for Lego. You've done Amazon for Nordic Naturals and now for Super ATV. Yeah. Um, all of these accounts in general are performing much better than the average seller. They all have good products, yeah. good reviews. They're ranked organically. They have probably most of their advertising set up, I'm assuming. And, you know, in general, they're doing pretty well. So what's like your audit process for these accounts to find out what that next step is or what more you can do to improve performance? Yeah. So I would say the first thing I do now, I didn't always do this. I, I learned this through not doing it, but I always go through and I audit and take a look at how much of the spend is going to branded spend. Um, I take the catalog of ASINs and if it's a bigger brand, um, you know, you need to go into vendor central and pull all your whole catalog out, not just your active ASINs and a company like that. There's thousands of, of ASINs or like my company now there's thousands. So I pull the sponsor product search term report and I pull the targeting report and make sure to pull both. Um, cause if you audit just the targeting report, um, you're going to miss all of the search terms that are coming through, like the auto campaigns and the pack campaigns. And I just look at like how much of my spend is going to branded spend, how much of my sales, um, you know, is it segmented between branded and unbranded? And if it's not, you know, what, what are their percentages looking like? So, um, it's important to know like what, what your, your average role is, is for both branded and unbranded, not that it can't be improved, but you know, recently, um, I had a, a really good increase in performance and I was like, well, let me just double check and make sure that there's not a lot of leakage. Let's make sure that it's like the AI I'm using is working pretty well and, and all that, see what I'm doing. Right. Uh, so I just did a quick audit and it was like, there's a little bit of bleeding of branded, but it was like not a big deal. And so, you know, you can correct it. Um, it also can help you see like, if you're taking over an account from someone, um, what are they doing? Are they not doing negations? Are they, um, like putting actual your own ASINs into unbranded campaigns. Um, like there was, I was working with an agency years ago and they were doing some research for us. And so they sent us this massive list of ASINs, like advertise your products on these product pages. Um, so I go through it and I'm like, a bunch of these are our own. Like I was like, you guys didn't go through and filter it. And so I asked them to go back and do it. And they had just done like a quick helium 10, like general keyword search and just sent me the results. They didn't like pull out all of our own products and stuff like that. So, you know, you just want to make sure like if I had just thrown those in there, I would have been like, oh, we're performing really well, but I'm not, you know, maybe I'm not seeing an impact on the overall revenue. Uh, one of the worst I've seen is where they purposely put branded ASINs into as targets into campaigns and and when I first did it, it didn't seem like it was that big of a deal, but I waited a month and I took a look and it was such a massive scale. It was like half of our ad spend was going to just advertising on our own products, half of our unbranded ad spend, because we already had branded ad spend. And then later in that year, I checked another month um, before it had been fixed. And it was something like 70% of our, our sponsor product spend was going to only advertising on our own products. And it was like, over 80% of our sales of our ad sales. So I was like, yeah, this is not, this is not how we want to spend money. And, uh, you know, so you can check the work of other people and also check yourself. Like I was saying, like my performance improved recently. I was like, let me just double check, make sure. Um, and like, yeah, overall the performance was actually improving. Um, so, so that's what I audit most. Um, then you want to just, I don't, I'm not a big fan of having a lot of ad groups in campaigns. Um, you don't have as much control over the campaigns. Um, you, you don't really get valuable placement data. Um, and so I just check, like, if there's a thousand targets in an ad group, you know, if you do that across your whole account, that's not going to be very effective. If you have some campaigns like that that are just a catch-all, that would be okay. So I look out for that. Um but yeah, really the first thing, even my job here, my first day, that was the audit I did. I checked and uh, I checked a couple different periods. I, I went and found a report from the year before. I checked the last 60 days and I was like, yeah, sure enough, there's some branded leakage that that needs to be tidied up. So that makes sense. So usually when people have like the should I advertise on my brand keyword and ASINs argument, it's not at this scale. So for a company like Lego, 
like the actual product is synonymous with the brand name, right? And anything else that doesn't come from Lego Group is most likely going to be seen as like a knockoff. So at that point, like, how, how do you look at branded spend and how do you know, like, you know, this is how much I spend on branded and is this too much? Is this too little? How do you kind of look at that? Yeah, I would say most people have like a guideline of, of you know, I don't want to spend more than 10% or more than 20% on branded spend. Um, and so you just kind of check yourself with that. Like there's been times where, uh, you know, maybe it's like Cyber 5 or Prime Day and branded spend could get out of control. So you, you have to have a plan of if I'm in this high velocity time period, how am I going to pull back on this branded spend? And so you need to have a plan. You need to mostly stick with it. Um, so that can be a little bit more complicated, right? Like uh, if you're spending too much on branded, like you can pull back by, you know, like very quickly, like lowering the bids is not going to help that much uh, with a big account in the moment. Like you can cut budgets very quickly. You can pause campaigns. Um, and also if you prioritize how you're spending money, that helps. For me, I love, I always want a branded sponsor brand ad. And of course I want sponsor product ads, but you know, I can tier them on level and priority, right? Like, do I want to advertise a $10 product or a $50 product or a $200 product? If you think about those, think of the toy, um, the toy industry, the $10 pro product, you'll probably sell a lot, but you're not going to make a lot of profit. $200 product, people are not spontaneously buying that. So you want to find that sweet spot. And so it's like, if I need to pull back, I need to know what is my priority. Um, so I can like, okay, let me lower all the bids or the budgets for the $10 and the $20 product and, and just keep these core, this core um, price range. Um, so I think, you know, having that percentage breakdown goal is really important. Uh, it just makes it so you don't have to think too much as well, right? If I know it's 10%, I know I want to do sponsor brands. I'll just cut all my sponsor product uh, spend if it's getting out of control, but. That makes sense. So how do you guys set like a plan of action on like, you just finished your audit and you want to set your plan of action. And you also want to prioritize like what gets done first, since obviously you guys would have a lot to do at an account of this size. So how do you kind of think of that? Yeah, I it's, it's really highly dependent on the category. Um, you know, in supplements, I had a priority list of like, here's tier one, tier two and two, tier three products. So, you know, I'd focus on the top ones, get those campaigns straightened out. Uh, make sure we're winning on the keywords we want to win on for those. Um, with my company now, there's not like a top tier uh, products. There's not hero products. There's not like those 10 products where you're like, if I promote these, people will come back and buy the other ones. Um, we have thousands of products. Um, you can't launch your keywords super wide because um, let's say if you have a Polaris Razor 1000, um, and it's a 2022 edition. Well, you don't want that advertising on the 2024 edition. You also don't want it, and this is going to get technical if you don't know these vehicles, but like you don't want it advertising on a Polaris um, Razor XP or a XP Pro because they're different vehicles and they might not fit the same. So it's just a lot different. Like for me here, my priority is like making sure every, every product is being advertised somehow. Uh, which is a priority at every place um, I've worked at. But, um, you know, sometimes that doesn't always work. If you if you have a smaller account, um, you know, you don't want to advertise every product. If, you're, if your budget is like $100,000 for a year or $60,000 for a year and you have 500 products, you don't want to advertise all of them. You're going to have to focus on, on just certain ones. That makes sense. Right, so I've done a few audits um, in my time and I've uncovered some weird stuff. I've seen accounts where there was about like $800,000 in monthly attributed sales to VCPM campaigns. That oh, like no. The incremental revenue. So, yeah. you know, you've done a bunch of agency work. You've worked at a few different companies. What are some of the more unusual things you've uncovered? Yeah, you know, somebody was talking about that on LinkedIn the other day. Uh, I forgot who it was. I can see his face. Uh, I forgot his name. Anyways, he's super active on LinkedIn. He has an agency, but he had brought up that topic. Yeah, when that first launched in 2019, I was working at Nordic Naturals 
And I had just launched like a handful of those campaigns because I was like, the attribution seems wonky. Well, like within a, less than a month, it was taking credit for every single sale on the account. Like, you know, this, the overall sales was X amount. And this is saying it's taking like 99%. But then you add in all the other advertisements. Well, then that's like double what our overall sales are. So I kind of learned early on, like, hey, like this is just a bonus thing. Like it, you got to keep it segmented so it's easy to pull that data out of the overall data. Um, but yeah, those are just interesting. Uh, you know, all these little different campaigns that can be manipulated. But um, but yeah, so I mean, your question is like, what else have I seen? Um that one I was telling you about where people were purposely putting those products in, um, it was pretty massive. Uh, I was really shocked when I saw it and the people defended this strategy. Like first they said it was a mistake. Then they said, Oh, this is like an actual strategy. Um, and I was like, this is, I, what I did is I went in and I asked like 25 people or so that I know in our industry. I said, Hey, have you seen this before? what do you think about this strategy? Not a single, per every person was like, yeah, this is just to inflate performance. And so, you know, you can't change everything day one. Uh, in that case, it took quite a while to change, to uproot that out of the account um, just because people defended it. Um, with that account as well, we would track the branded spend. Like you would get like a Looker or Google data, um, what's it called? Data suite. And you just, you pull that data and you can get it reported on every week. So you can see like, Hey, our, you know, there was like a 5% of our spend for sponsor products went to branded based on pulling this data out and having it, you know, done automatically. I currently don't do that. I just spot check it cause it's too much work to, to set up the reporting like that for now. Um, that's something we can do later, but, uh, so that was, that was the thing. So we would, you could see if it would spike. Well, at one point, the person at the agency, let's take a step back. So first of all, you need you need that catalog of ASINs to even pull the data and compare it to, right? So having the right like base of ASINs is important. So if you don't have that, then you can't track what you're, you're doing, right? Seems simple. Well, at this agency, and I didn't find this out till later, they edited the catalog to where it would have less ASINs in it. So it looked like our branded leakage was like very minimal, like, you know, like 1% or less than 1%. Um, months later, I find out it was changed and I asked why. There was no answer. Basically, they had changed the catalog to, to manipulate that data we were getting every week. Not even every week. I had access to this dashboard. I could change it. So months later, we fix it. And it turns out I start looking back at past reports and our branded spin was even worse um then i thought when i looked back to like reports before i i had uh had started working on that account so it's like people will do a lot of things to cover their tracks um there you know there's one agency i worked at and you know just keeping them accountable i was asking for certain deliverables that were pretty late and you know they were they were a little stressed out they were really overworked i was like look like hey this is what we need so you guys said you deliver um like we just need it done. I'd rather have it done thoroughly than, than half acid. And, uh, and somebody at the agency went to like our president and like really twisted what was going on. And so like our team got spoken to was like, Hey, just chill out. And it was like, that's because this account was so valuable to them. It was worth like a crazy amount of money to their company. Um, and then I've experienced that at another place, right? Like just the, just the relationship, right? Like, just holding somebody accountable can piss people off if they're not doing a good job and, and they'll, they'll, they'll lie to cover their tracks. And so it's, it's, it's important to work with trustworthy people. Um, so I've had a couple of those experiences where just, uh, people are deceitful. They're going to cover their tracks and, um, you know, it makes it hard cause you're trying to do your day job. You can't be policing somebody that you should be, should be doing their job. So. Yeah. This kind of relates to another question I was going to ask. Um, you've worked on mostly big accounts from what I can see. And I was going to ask, like, what are some issues that you face running those big accounts that maybe some smaller sellers wouldn't be aware of? Um, I would say like your mistakes can be, 
<laughs> can just uh, be much larger. Um, at least when you're on a big account too, the nice thing is that you can run everything standard, the same strategy, and then you've got room in the budget to experiment. Um, and that is really cool. It's really fun. Um, like I can give one example. Um, when I worked at Lego, fidget toys were still really popular. I haven't checked the toy category, but for years it was still like a top five term. And so you can't see my desk, but I still have like little Lego pieces that during a meeting I would just like fidget with. Um, I'm not as in as many meetings as when I worked at Lego. It's just uh, I'm in far less meetings. But I was like, okay, I'm like basically I have fidget toys. Like we have the perfect product to be a fidget toy. And, and so I was like, we should have a fidget toy box or something like that. And so me and my colleague were talking about it. I was like, hey, let's just do some uh, – fidget toy ads and just see if like we can sell well on that keyword so set up like i don't remember how many campaigns maybe like five campaigns i bid really aggressively because it's a really competitive category and it was just a complete disaster like it just i think the roas was like a 0.25 or something and usually you want to give it a while but i think i killed it after 10 days it was just like this is just not working. Uh, people clearly don't want this. They just want this box of, you know, stuff to, to play with. It's so like something like that. Like if your budget is tight, you can't do that on a smaller account, you know, like um, or, you know, with supplements, I got to experiment a lot with really high bids just to see what it was. Um, like, for example, when I first got to Nordic Naturals, my boss was like, hey, just bid $30, $40 on these terms. Just see what the upper band is. I was like, are you serious? Like, I've never heard of somebody trying this. And so I did it and I figured out like, hey, this is like the top end of, of the CPC spectrum. Um, but I had that wiggle room, right? And I didn't do it for several days. I'd do it for like a day and see what happens. So that was really fun. Um, and that taught me a lot about competing in real time in the supplement industry because I could figure out, like, I got really good at knowing all my competitors. I could tell when Nature's Bounty had extra budget or Mega Red or whoever. And then I would bid higher because they're kicking me out of that top spot. Well, if I bid high enough for at least a day, they would disappear altogether. And then my CPCs actually went down. So it's kind of like you bid somebody up, they'll tap out, get out of the auction, and then you could end up spending less money. And uh, I know somebody in the in the toy industry that did that as well, because um, when I worked at Lego, I did see not a direct competitor, but somebody we would bid against um, in the toy industry. I met I met the person that ran the account um, after I worked at Lego, and I just said like, "Hey, like this is what you guys used to do, right? You used to bid really high." Because I did that stress test when I was at Lego just for like an afternoon. I bid forty nine dollars to see where the top end would be at. And these guys were bidding like eight or nine dollars for sponsor products and they bid forty nine dollars for sponsor brand ads. And so like I'm like I'm not gonna outbid that person on Black Friday. Um but I talked to them and that was their strategy. They would bid really high. People would momentarily try to try to beat them and they just couldn't. So they they said it worked really well for them. I was like, man, you guys made my life a pain in the butt uh, you know, for a while. So th those are some interesting things that you can do. You know, you can be a little bit riskier. For my account now, it's it's a pretty decent size. And um, I have one sponsor brand lately that just is absolutely terrible. Um, it, it's not, a, it was not a risky one, but it was just like, I don't know why I've got all the right keywords. I'm bidding high. Um, you know, my agency, I was like, hey, what do you guys think? And they gave me some feedback that I'm going to take and, and make some changes. But I thought it at least would have done like a decent role. I was like a three. Uh, I wasn't expecting something really great, but it was like abysmal. So, so yeah. What about like some of the things that worked? I saw on your profile that you saved one of the brands that you worked at like $3 million in spend, which is way more than most others are even spending like for their entire account. And yeah. Also, so yeah. it was a similar thing to what I explained earlier, where there was a massive bleeding of, um, branded spend being put into unbranded campaigns. So that's, a, that's another, another place that I found the same exact issue. And it was like, okay, well, why are these products in here? Like, well, this product, you know, might be discontinued. So 
a, another seller might sell it. So they might be a competitor. And I'm like, okay, I'd ask them, well, what brand is it? And they'd be like, uh, well, well, it's our own brand and we still sell it through Amazon. So why are we putting this into an unbranded category when we advertise our current catalog on it? And uh, so that was another thing. So when I finally uprooted that, I, I counted up, um, you know, how much I would have saved over that year had it had that never happened. And it was a minimum of that much. And then the, the ad sales were, you know, astronomical uh, to, to uproot that and, and get that out of those campaigns. Because really, like, that money could have been used towards advertising on competitors or trying to get top of search. Um, so... So yeah, long story short, it's much the same thing of like auditing. And so this, you know, the stakes are a little bit higher. Um, but I would also say like, you know, I started off small. I started off with my own, uh, my own product. I didn't spend a lot of money because it was my own money, right? Like, and I try to treat every job like that. Like treat it as if you were spending your own money um, on one hand, but then on the other hand, as you're growing and you, you get access to bigger accounts, um, you can't be intimidated like by a higher skew count, by a bigger but by a bigger budget. So you need that balance of I'm gonna spend this money like it's my own, but then also like in a way just simplify it. like this is just numbers and digits and you know, we need to get more higher digits. And if you just look at it from like a math or problem solving uh, aspect, you need to have both sides, right? Where you know, you got to take it personal and take responsibility for that job. But you also got to be like, okay, I need to work through the math and, and do what I can. Right, that's interesting. I also saw you managed to increase like the number of subscribers for subscribency for one of the companies you worked at. A lot of people are interested in doing that right now, just because of yeah. rising ad costs. So maybe like you can give us an idea of how maybe someone could do the same for their account. Yeah, and you know, I'm I haven't been in the supplement space. I I would imagine it's more competitive when it was then. It was really competitive. There's a number of things I did. Um, one thing I did was try to um, first of all, we didn't have subscribe and save across the entire catalog. Like a lot of companies, we did have like map policies where we can't lower the price even with subscribe and save. And so, what I did is I had to get permission for this, but our team. I had our team like add 0% subscribe and save to the entire catalog. So where we only had about probably 15 or 20 products where we could actually do a subscribe and save of 5%. Um, we got hundreds of products added to the 0%. It wasn't like, like you couldn't just do it quickly because we also had other sellers on those ASINs that, that, um, that actually were the subscribe and save seller. Um, so we would like create cases and ask for it to be transferred to us. Um, they would say the sales are too low to add it. So it was a quite a, quite a, took several months. And so like, I think after like five months, we were at like 90%, like we were still submitting cases every week. So that one, that helps, right? We all have decision fatigue. We all want to make less decisions. We don't want to keep track and manage so much stuff. Um, you know, you don't want to like forget your supplements. Like I actually have my Nordic Naturals here. Uh, I try to keep it next to my desk to remember uh, taking it. But um, yeah, just human nature, right? You want to make less decisions. And so at the time, I love this Red Bull that is only available on Amazon by the case. And I didn't care if I saved money. And so I just try looking at it from the consumer's perspective. Like Nordic had a really good, loyal I don't want to say fan base, but customer base, people that are loyal, they get excited. People get excited when they found out I worked at Nordic Naturals. So, um, so I can tell you all that stuff, but the thing is we also had really good brand equity. Like the brand had a really good reputation, um, in the U S and so that of course you can't just build overnight. You can't do with Facebook ads, but, um, we worked with what we had and really helped that. I also did a lot of sponsor brand ads that called out subscribe and save. And back then you couldn't do that, but I would just uh, change the title and the brand and get it approved. And I would talk to my ad manager about it. And um, I just like, Hey, this is what I'm trying to do. Um, it should be okay. And eventually they like changed the language after I, I pushed on it to where like you can include subscribe and save info in the sponsor brand ad. 
So, so I think it's a combo of all that, right? I worked for a great brand, so that was super helpful. <laughs> you know, if I had like Joe Schmo's, you know, fish oil that, you know, the guy just slapped a cool Fiverr logo on it, you're not going to be able to do the same thing as a brand that has put in the work, is at, you know, what, 10,000 retailers or whatever we were at. So, you know, you got to have a balance. Same with, same with when you're selling Lego products, right? Like there's just some things that are, you're just going to, you're starting ahead already because you're working for a great brand, but it's still a lot of hard work. It doesn't, you're not given anything for free uh, on Amazon. So um, that is true about reporting. What do you guys do for reporting? Do you have like certain tools? Like I know there are tools out there that help you track market share. Um, you know, a lot of big companies like to use tools like Stackline because it helps you with like yep. reporting yep. And stuff. So what do you guys actually track on like a monthly or bi-weekly basis? And what are like the most important numbers for you? Yeah, so it's been a little bit different at each job and, and really it just uh, it just depends. So one thing that I don't track as much at my current job as I have at previous jobs is the new to brand percentage. Um, the new to brand percentage, I think, is really important. And it's great that Amazon opened up the sponsor product new to brand percentage. Um, so I was always checking that. Um, I would just see what is our baseline uh, and then like where can we go above and beyond uh, what keyword like before they they uh, release AMC, which I'm not an expert in AMC. There's there's definitely some uh, some things I want to learn to to utilize that. But uh, there was a sponsor brands report that was the first one to report new to brand percentage by product and by keyword. And so I would do some some backwards math and pull it and say like, okay, what are our keywords that are leading the most to new to brand? So that was one that was. Uh, I think only available for like a year or two before AMC rolled out last year. Um, new to brand isn't that important to me right now. Really overall sales, like what what is my what is my ROAS? You know, I hate the word tacos, but it's a, it's a good one to look at. Um, if you have different product lines, I always pull different product lines and look at how are they performing overall with advertising and overall sales. So let's say this product line, I, my it's costing me, 10% of sales to, to promote this, this um, product category. But my average is like at 8%. So I'm like, okay, so I'm overspending for this theme or this, um, this category. And then maybe there's some that are much lower, but like justified, right? Like if I'm selling a Star Wars set when there's like a big Star Wars movie coming out or Mandalorian is doing well, you know, I could probably spend less money because it's just going to sell really well. So really just getting to know your brand. You like, I'm only what, seven months into my job. I love my job. I'm learning a lot all the time. Um, and so it just, you got to master your, your brand and your industry to kind of know, um, what's important. What are you looking for? So as far as reporting, I use PackView for the share of voice reporting. Um, it's keyword based. So it's based on the keywords you input. And I think for some brands, I think it's going to be good enough. Um, the scraping's pretty good. It mines your competitor ASINs. It tells you who your top competitors are, which then can help you target their products to advertise as well. Um, it's not a whole category encompassing tool that they have, but not everybody really needs that, to be honest. Um, you know, even when I worked at Lego, like, and this is not like a, a secret or anything. This is based on like you can scrape keywords and see like our share of voice in the toy category, or I shouldn't say our share of voice, but you would just look at all the top ones and then you have like the other field, which is everybody else. It would still be like 80% other other brands, like even in a highly competitive field like that. So it's good to know like where you stand and in, in, in that. So I've not used Stackline. I've done a couple demos. Um, I think it would be a great value add. I know a lot of people that use it. Um, for me, I'm in the midst of finishing up restructuring some advertising, working with the agency that's helping me with that. And so I wanted to do that before I add in like another layer. Cause the thing is like, is it going to be just nice to have, or is that info going to give you info that will help you change your strategy and make more money? Um, I think with all the data we have, there's so much data, but how much of it is going to change your mind or, or change your direction? I think 
that's what is, um, you know, we have all this surplus of data over the last few years that we dreamed of, you know, five years ago as an industry. Um, so, so yeah, I know there's some other tools. Um, one of my old directors, he does a lot of data visual, uh, what's it called? His name's James, him and him and this other guy, they run a company called Bespoke. And basically they can pull all your data and really make it look really nice and, and beautiful. And like, you can just, basically it's a great data tool. Um, so I was going to try them out, um, you know, eventually, but so far I'm using PackView Commerce, I'm using PackView for ads. And then there's just some things that I just look in the console real quick. So, so. Okay, perfect. Um, how do you feel like, I guess, team structure? You've mentioned multiple yeah. times that you're using an agency. So how do you kind of view that for just hiring people internally to run your ads for you? I guess what's like the logic behind it? Yeah, I think it's it's getting so complex. I would say most people I talk to also have pretty lean teams. So you've got to be really intelligent about, you know, what are your own strengths and weaknesses that you can contribute to the account? Where do you need help? Um, like, I need somebody to work on case cases and managing the catalog or like, hey, all these parent ASINs are broken. We need somebody to work on it. So you need somebody that can do some of that stuff that's not so glamorous, um, that has some resiliency, right? I think, you know, I, I have, an, have a member on my team that is helping out more with Amazon and, you know, learning the frustrations. And she was like, just talking recently about like, yeah, this and this and this. And I just said like, you know, like, welcome to the industry. Like, you can't get too worked up. Uh, you're going to have to resubmit tickets. You're going to have to follow up when seller support is not answering you properly. Um, so you need that quality of like, you need to be a little bit tough because you do need to push back on support. I have a ticket open since Monday where there's this report that's missing data and we really need this data. Um, it's, it's in regards to our shipments. And uh, they're telling me how to like go find it for one product <laughs> or one order. And it's like, I need this for thousands of products. So you got to you gotta be resilient uh, as far as like character, um, not character, but just the quality. Like, And you can't like let stuff bother you too much. Um, but yeah, you just really need to map out what do you need the most help with? Like, what are you really good at? Like, what am I good at? Like, I shouldn't be spending my time in cases. I, I still need to do it from time to time, but that would be best if I had somebody that could do that. Um, and I would say too, like, it depends on what you need. Like, do you have the capacity to bring someone on and they know 50% of what you need them to know and you can train them the rest or do you need them to come in and have experience and be able to, you know, think of things you haven't thought of. Um, like we have, uh, we have a, a part-time employee that used to work at our company full time. And uh, she jumped right in and was like, Hey, I found this and this and this. And I'm like, well, I would have, I wouldn't have found that for six months. Cause I would have never been looking at this. Um, so you just, you need people that are curious, resilient. Um, and of course you need people that are talented uh, for different roles, but agency just depends. Um, depends on what your stage at. You might need an agency for six months or a year to help clean up your catalog, um, to help you with things. You might need an agency just for advertising. Um, and it just depends on your skills. Like I have a lot of experience with advertising, um, but I still hired an agency to really help launch and, and consult um, well, to relaunch, uh, they basically launched like, I don't know, 30,000 campaigns or something like that for us. Um, so like I could do that, but like, I'd be working a hundred hours a week and like be a terrible parent, a terrible husband, probably not be good at my job if I was working that much. So you got to know what your strengths and weaknesses are and what should you outsource. Um, it's also helpful that, you know, to be competent enough to almost be an expert, right? Like, like we were talking about to, to audit these advertising accounts. That's something that can be taught. I've actually thought about creating a LinkedIn post of like, Hey, this is how you audit it. You don't need to be an ads expert. You just need to be able to follow directions and know how to use Excel with some basic functions. Um, uh, you know, because I've been on a lot of pitches. I've seen agencies hired in, you know, they'll, I don't want to generalize, but I've just seen quite a few where 
they'll lie about like, oh, we have this capacity and you get started and they don't, or we can do this. And it's like, well, there's one thing if you're behind on a project, it's a whole nother thing. If you say you have something you don't have, like, uh, that's a pretty serious offense. Um, so you gotta be able to detect the BS in those pitches. And I've been in somewhere I'm like this person's absolutely lying. Um, or, you know, or yeah, I don't think they have this capability. Uh, and maybe you don't have that say in the process, right? Not all my roles have I had that say to veto something. Um, and then I've seen it, you know, okay, I was right. Like they don't know what they're talking about. Oh, this is right. So, um, you know, I think also networking too, like getting word of mouth. Like I avoided one, one agency uh, that way where I, I talked to five people and they all five gave me the same feedback. So I avoided a disaster there. So I don't know. I feel like I'm going off on a tangent, but really uh, there's different ways to hire what you need. And I think the thing is you got to network and meet other people. Um, like you interviewed Keith before and me and Keith talk, maybe not every week. Sometimes we'll talk a couple times a week, but our roles are, are pretty identical. Our team setup is different. There's a lot of things different, but we're doing the same job for the most part. Um, and having you know, people you meet that are in the same position um, that can help, um, I think has been super vital for me. So networking, it sounds like a terrible word, but once I figured out you're just making friends with people, um, if you look at it that way, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't feel sleazy. Like when I was in college, it sounded like I needed to be a used car salesman. Um, so, yeah. So for my final and favorite question, um, You've hired like a ton of Amazon uh, advertising experts. I have some experience with that too. I have an entire process from like the questions I ask, the case study I give and how I evaluate people and actually document every step. And I kind of test it so I can say like, these are the factors that I've noticed or these are the things that I, um, you know, maybe these are the things that stood out to me in the actual interview. And this is how it correlated with performance. So I'm actually like a huge nerd when it comes to hiring. Just That recruiting. sounds great. I could probably learn something from you then because that sounds great. Yeah. I mean, I have an entire process from like the interview questions to like, I, I could, it sounds ridiculous, but it's gotten to the point where like within the first two or three minutes, I could realistically yeah. thought if this is someone I'm going to hire or not. I don't even need the full like, 20 or 30 minute interview no way you should share that with me i'm always up for learning uh so i could probably learn a lot from you yeah i mean it's mostly about like the research that they've done up front so someone's super excited and super curious about their job they're gonna show up knowing a ton about what you do what you guys are looking for and yeah. maybe about the role and someone who just like applied to every single position they could find on yeah go up to the stress the biggest tent, then I want to find someone who reads books, someone who I think has the mental capacity to think outside of what they just learned. Because a lot of people are just like repeating what someone else told them or repeating what they've learned over the years. I want someone that's going to be able to find the solution outside of what they've dealt with before. So for example, with my case studies for like Amazon PPC specialists, uh, what I do is I actually give them a case study or a scenario where a brand wants to start running Facebook ads because I want to see how well this person is going to be able to adapt and if they're going to be able to create a good Facebook ads plan and relate that back into that account's goals for Amazon ads, right? So it's kind of oh, like okay. um, a shift where you want to, I guess, test how flexible someone's thinking is or how well they're able to use their brain and come up with, I guess, different strategies in unfamiliar scenarios. So that's kind of my take on hiring. It's worked pretty well for me, but I'm not curious what you guys do. Yeah, when I so I interviewed a lot of people for Amazon marketing positions for marketer hire, and it was it was really freelancer. So I would get them when they've been kind of vetted, but sometimes you know some people would slip through that didn't have quite the experience. I would say usually the same. I would know within a few minutes if they if they had the experience. Um, but I would still go through the questions or just leave it open-ended and let them keep talking. Um, cause there was a handful of times where my first impression was like, yeah, I don't think this person knows what they're talking about, but sometimes they'd be really nervous, even though it was just for like a freelance position. And then sometimes I'm like, well, you know, I've, inter I've interviewed a ton since I moved back to the U S since 2015. 
I've probably been in like 150 interviews since then. Um, like probably close to half of those were the first year when I moved back. And it's like, sometimes I know what I'm talking about. And then after when I've interviewed, it's like, dang, I didn't really communicate that well. Or maybe there was one time I didn't get a job and they did give me feedback as to why. And the reason they gave was really silly. And I'm like, I did not communicate well enough what I knew. Part of it, they also didn't, what I thought was a small issue for them was like a really like game changer for them on the candidate side. So I try to give people a chance as well, because there's a handful where the second half of the interview, they started to really explain things in detail after they got over the nerves and they really knew what they were talking about. But I would agree. Um, I would just ask different questions. I'd, I'd ask them about their, their structure or their strategy, um, their biggest wins. Um, and usually like people, if you just let people talk, they'll just, they'll just talk, right? Like, like we're doing today. And so you just, they'll start telling, talking about details and, and then you can kind of find out, do they know what they're talking about? And, and, uh, you know, are they going to be doing a great job? Um, also, yeah, some people would be like enthusiastic. Some people would not. And it's like, you want some enthusiasm. Like, you know, like I'm, I love the products that like we make accessories for side by sides and, and ATVs. And like my kid has a, has a quad and goes in the backyard and my, other parts of my family, we go off-roading. And so if you're enthusiastic, uh, it makes a big difference because you want to do a good job. You want to do a good job for your teammates, for your, for your business, for your clients. Um, and like you were saying, like I worked at agencies and I tried to be enthusiastic and go all in for their products because I had had my own product. Like I had a microfiber mitt to wash your car and I was super passionate about microfiber mitts. So it's like, well, just, uh, you know, maybe it's just about doing the best job you can and, and uh, that's where your passion and enthusiasm can come through. So I don't know about books, man. I got kids. I don't really read books that much, but I listen to podcasts. So... But yeah, uh, my, my question specifically for them is how do you learn? And if someone doesn't read uh, books, but they do other things, then, you know, it shows me that they're curious. My actual controversial take on hiring is I never actually ask technical questions. So if I'm interviewing someone, I'd never ask them about like their strategies or how they view Amazon mm. or like the advertising side of things. I never bring that up. I'm pretty much able to tell from just general questions whether this person's good or not. Because I, um, I started working like super young. I started working when I was nine years old. I'd like build games online and sell them and stuff. So what yeah. I learned through that is even if you're like the underdog and you have no experience, if you're talented and you can learn super fast and you actually enjoy what you're doing, you're going to run circles around the older guy that's been doing the same thing for like 10 years. Yeah. Right? So I don't really care that much about the experience. I've hired college kids that are doing better than third year olds that I've hired. And I'm just trying to test like in the interview, like is this guy or girl yeah. genuinely smart? Like is this someone with a brain that's going to be able to think outside the box and someone who's going to be able to learn on the job, right? And I, I've, I've even done interviews. And again, this sounds stupid, but I've done interviews where I was doing most of the talking. So I've done interviews and this is one of my favorite hires. I was just talking the whole time about our product and yeah. our like, vision and what we're trying to build. And I wanted to see if they genuinely get excited. Right? Like if I spoke about oh, the future yeah. of PPC and the future of Amazon ads, and you can see it in their eyes, because if like someone has fake enthusiasm, it's super obvious. But you can see like in their eyes and like in the uplift of the tone of their voice, if you were able to get this person actually excited about you wanna about what you want to build or what you guys are currently working on yeah and you can also ask them questions like why do you get into this like for example let's assume i'm hiring for marketing off of amazon right now like marketing for my startup i could ask someone like you know what 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 is it about marketing that you like why do you get into this what are some examples of other companies marketing that you thought was super interesting and if someone's actually interested in marketing they can be like hey safe um grammarly had this seo strategy it did super, super well for them and took them from X revenue to Y revenue. And it only cost them this much to run, right? So if you're super interested yeah. and you're super smart and you're super curious about what you do, you can learn anything. And it's very obvious if that person likes what they do or not. So I'm just looking for someone that's into what they do. That's cool. I like want to see, you know, after the podcast, I want to hear more of your process. This sounds great. Like I said, yeah. there's, there's tons that I can learn. 
Uh, I have an interview later today, and I have uh, a couple more early next week. Um, so I'm going through interviews right now too. So would love yeah. to to pick up some more tips because I'm in the midst of it right now. Uh, yeah. No, sucks. I mean we've 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 been testing a few different things, and you know we're about to wrap up here because we're almost out of time. But you know even yeah. stuff like with Steve Jobs, and Steve is a bit rude, so I try not to copy him too much. But yeah. he do things like he'd show up to an interview and he'd just tell someone, for example, like, why, why do you work at Disney? Disney is a terrible company. And he'd want to see if that person would like retaliate to retaliate or like disagree with them. Or if they'd be like, oh, yeah, I maybe shouldn't have been working at Disney. Right. Because if someone's like just going to give up that easily and say that they shouldn't have been doing that work or what they did before didn't matter. Yeah. Then, you know, it's just like a yes person. Whereas if someone retaliates and says, hey, Disney's actually better than Apple and here's why, then that's someone interesting. That's someone you want to start working with. So I don't know. I personally find this stuff interesting. I spend like three, four, five hours a week just reading up on this stuff. But, that's cool. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm always trying to learn. And he, I think LinkedIn is a great resource. Um, there's almost two, like when it comes to advertising, since my role is not solely based on advertising anymore, it's it's hard to justify spending all that time reading stuff, but there's so much great free content that you can pick up on. Um, there's that guy, I don't want to mess up his name. He works for Incremental Digital. I think he posts some really great content. Mustafa Nuzi. Starts with an M, yeah. yeah. Uh, he posts some great content. Joe from Ad Advance posts great content. Uh, there's just a lot of great free resources and um, – you just have to have the time, but yeah, there's so much stuff to learn. Um, I'm learning all the time. A lot of times it's like, you know, I have a lot of good experience and still sometimes I just feel like a rookie at times. Um, like I was telling you, I have an ad right now that I sent to my agency. It was like, Hey, like, obviously there's room for improvement here, but you know, what else? Uh, and so they gave me some feedback. It's like, yeah, it's like, you know, you just always have to be learning. Like, that phrase, it's always day one. Uh, there's a lot of days like that where I'm just like, man, I feel like, you know, I've never worked a job before or something. Or, you know, you just sometimes you just need a good night's sleep and, and wake up and start tackling problems again. But right. cool. I agree 100%. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I had yeah. a lot of fun filming this with you. Um, and where can our listeners find out more about you? Uh, I, I just use LinkedIn. I don't. I don't do like Twitter or X or whatever. Um, I'll post some things when I can. And that one I was telling you about, like how to do an audit. I actually did write a post, um, but I think I need to do it with like a carousel with some clear instructions. But, you know, to audit, audit the account is pretty simple. Um, I think everybody should do it. I think even if you work at an agency, you should be auditing the accounts that people are running. Because I've seen things where, you know, people's leaders didn't know what, what their um, person was doing. Uh, so they had no idea that like there was all this branded bleeding or something like that. So I think it should be a standard audit. And um, but yeah, anyways, LinkedIn is great. Hopefully I'll post some stuff there. Uh, I don't post as much as I used to just because it's been a really busy season right now. But um, but yeah, like to contribute where I can. I know a lot of people contribute to everyone's success on LinkedIn. So I try to try to share when I can. Thank you so much for coming on. Awesome. Thanks.